Hello, we're alive. Um, okay. Today we're going to be talking about RF filters, and kind of at the end of that, we're going to uh, do kind of a fast summary, a uh, system overview of kind of all the different building blocks we've talked about throughout the quarter so far. Um, so some brief announcements. Uh, assignment three was due on Saturday. If your team hasn't finished assignment three, try to finish assignment three. And uh, also collaborate with your teams because um, the assignments will ramp up and become more involved, more decision making and whatnot. So um, it'll become more and more imperative that you work as a team as a as assignments go on, especially going into winter quarter. Speaking of which, um, there's no like specific assignment for uh, after this lecture. Um, it's just going to be pretty much, okay, you have all the building blocks, put them together, and we'll look at your simulated system kind of uh, at the towards the beginning of winter quarter. So uh, that's all I've got for announcements. Um, sorry, real quick, one last announcement, idea hacks, oh, yeah. uh, I think application just went live at 6, and it's a lot of fun, um, especially, you know, take it as serious as you want to, I think the first time I did it, I did one of those, you know, hackathon all night type stunts, the second time I was done with that shit, so I just went there for like 60 hours, goofed around with people, had a, had a good time, and I was planning on doing something similar this year as well. Um, yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun, um, if you can't find a bunch of people that you want to hack with, sign up as a volunteer. That's just as much fun because all the people you see in classes and clubs will still be there. You get to roam around, mess with people as they're hacking. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Right, right, right. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I did, I've done idea hacks my first two years. and Can confirm it's a very fun. Yeah, no, it's, 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 a, it's a really good time. Um, it's like, yeah, it, it's just a good time. Okay. All right, that's good. Okay. Um, talking about filters, um, so different types and some tools we use to make them, and then, uh, then like I said, at the end, kind of do an overview of our system. Okay, so let's start off with uh, why do we why do we filter at all? So uh, at the end of la last lecture, we talked about mixers. So um, let's say you're mixing. 1 megahertz with 4 megahertz, and you've got 5, but also 3, so you get some in different frequencies. Um, and we want to put that through another round of mixing to go up to 27, right? Um, first off, there's a lot of weird, so there's those two frequencies, then there are some of the harmonics from the, that make it look a little more square, so there's a ton of harmonics, and then if you mix, if you don't get rid of one of the so if you don't get rid of the three megahertz and all its harmonics and whatnot and then you try to mix it with something else then there's going to be like twice as many it's going to just be a mess um, so one reason we filter after mixing is to get rid of those unwanted some different frequencies um, also this one's kind of intuitive but um, when you it goes over the air there's a potential for other frequencies, your, your antenna is sensitive to not just exclusively the frequency of interest, there'll be s some other noise is able to um, get imposed on there. Um, they only left me going, so this is going to be an interesting for a point. Um, so uh, image reduction is a similar concept, um, I won't go too much into definitions, but let's say, a, let's say we have a frequency spectrum. Let's say we have a, let's say on our antenna we receive something at 27 mega, megahertz. Uh, has a, maybe it has a, I'll make this, let's just say it has a bandwidth of a 2. And then uh, let's say our, let's say we want to first down convert it to, uh, to 5 megahertz. So we're going to have a, an LO of uh, 22. So you guys kind of did that, did this as part of the mixer assignment, right? Okay, um, but what happens if there's some noise or maybe there's multiple radio stations playing at once? 
Um, what if there happens to be another station that's at a 17 and uh, it's just maybe it, I don't know, has some other, has some song on it, whatever. Um, so now if you mix these together, they'll get mapped down to, they'll get mapped down to the same frequency. So 27 uh, minus 22, that, this thing would get shifted and get centered, be centered at five, but also um, uh, 22 minus 17, this, this will also get mapped to five. So they'll be kind of superimposed on top of each other. And once they are combined, there's no way to undo this process. So if you don't filter, um, if you don't have a filter to kind of isolate this um, before you mix it to down convert, um, anything that gets superimposed and mapped to the same frequencies are going to overlap, and there's nothing you can do about it at that point. So uh, that's kind of so this image, this concept of image is where uh, there's something like on the other side of the LO frequency um, that's the same distance away um, that'll get mapped to the same thing. Okay. Uh, and yeah. Just a quick question of going off of this. Yeah. So when you mix, is there an order in which you need to do the addition and subtraction with like your input signal and your LO frequency, or is it just absolute value? So like what I'm saying is like if you have an input signal at 27 megahertz and you mix it with a 22 megahertz signal, mm -hmm. is the output the same as what it would be if your input signal was 22 megahertz and your LO was 27? Yes, because cosine of negative x is cosine x. Okay. So no. the math works out at that. The math works out. Okay. Yeah. So then either way is you just do 22 minus 27 and 22 plus 27 and you get absolute value. Sure. Okay. Okay. So that's. That's kind of the whole reason motivating. Okay, what do we? Why do we need a filter? And, um, there we go. Okay. All right. Um, so I think you can just leave it. Um, real quick, we're gonna just start by discussing common types of filters in the frequency domain. Um, this will be useful when we start thinking about which ones we want to create, and we can work down from what it looks like at the frequency domain. To, uh, what it would look like in the time domain and so on and so forth, yada, yada, yada. All right, um, real quick, ideally, what's the ideal filter? Any guesses? Like, ideal filter, if you can just theoretically pinch something out of the air, what's delta? the best possible delta function? Yeah. Exactly. That's the best possible filter. Uh, this is obviously not going to come through in um, real life. Um, so the next best thing would then be, um, I don't know, if you guys study this, but if you think of the delta as like a limiting case for the rect function, the next best thing would be something like the rect. This also doesn't really work because sharp edges like this are really hard to create. And so what you really get is maybe something that's close to this. Right? In the frequency domain. All right, so this is something that would be then uh, band pass filter, band pass obviously because it passes a certain band of frequencies and rejects all the rest. Um, you have a whole bunch of other types of filters. You have the low pass filter, that's the standard RC ones that you see. Then you have the high pass filter, which is like this. Um, then you have something that's called the low pass notched filter. So that's something like this. This is basically, in, in, you can think of it kind of as like a band stop filter, where what it's really doing is rejecting a certain band stop, but we call it low pass notch because it passes low, higher than uh, high pass. You flip that around and you basically get the high pass notch filter. Um, so those are some other things. Um, one that I thought was really cool um, when I first heard about it was the all pass filter. Um, which kind of seems useless because this is just a wire. Um, but you actually purposefully design things like this because what it lets you do is manipulate the phase. And um, you've probably seen something along these lines in 141, but if you haven't, you'll eventually see it. But also when you take 115B, it's part of the discussion there, um, which is phase is really important when you're uh, designing uh, 
amplifiers because phase margin stability for you know control feedback loops and it kind of lets you manipulate to what frequency the amplifier even works as an amplifier. But it's actually how does the thing change? So your amplitude stays amplitude is just one, so it doesn't amplify or no. unamplify. Yes. But it changes the phase. Yeah, so oh. this is mod edge of J omega. Mm -hmm. um, depending on the exact topology, your would be something like this, for example. Yeah, okay. I remember so that's how it would change phase. Right? And how do you get this? Like just a wire? Do you no, no, just just a wire would not do this. Yeah. Um, I'm actually not sure what the exact implementation of one of these would be. Um, I can look into it and right, get back I'll to you, or you can look into it. But yeah, I'm not I'm not entirely sure actually. But yeah, so just different kinds of filters. Generally speaking, you can do whatever you want. Really, the only thing that's important is high pass means you're passing the high frequencies. Low pass means you're passing the low frequencies. Band pass means you're passing whatever's in your band, rejecting the rest. Really quick, um, when when I say rejecting. Um, what that basically means is the difference in attenuation that the filter has um, between the frequencies it passes and the frequencies it rejects, um, we're going to use about negative 20 decibels as a guideline. Um, in terms of amplitude, that becomes a factor of 10, right? So that's why we're using an order of thumb. So that's what I mean by rejected. All right then. Let's start building towards RF filters. And to do that, let's start with the most basic filter we know, the RC low pass filter. So here we have plus minus, we have voltage, we have some source resistance RS. And if we're feeling cheeky, we can just use RS as part of our filter. Say this is some capacitor C. And voila, you have a low pass filter. And so I'm guessing you all have seen this in 111L, 11L? 111L, right? 111L, there we go. Um, so you'll remember that around omega naught, this is, I think, negative 3 decibels. Um, this is about 0. This is omega naught, and then this starts falling by 20 dB per decade. All right, so that's our simple RC filter. There's a couple of pretty big problems with this, right? Immediately, the first thing you might notice is, well, what happens if I stick an actual RL on the other side? Like, because earlier we discussed, we'll be using our filters to drive a whole bunch of things. The antenna, the next stage of the mixer, the you know, a whole bunch of things will be loading our filters. So what happens if I load my filter? Well, the first thing that happens is basically the capacitor is now seeing RS and RL in parallel. And so this omega naught also then becomes a function of RS and RL in parallel. Um, and so, you know, omega naught shifts, but that's not too bad, you can redo the calculations, you can change capacitance. So for example, if I say RS is equal to RL, is equal to some R, then my C mu would be half the capacitance of the old one, right? If these two, if the resistance doubles, then to keep the pole at the same place, my capacitance would have to half. But there's a slightly bigger problem than that, which is if you now have RS and RL here, if you look at this critical point, this now drops to negative 6 dB if you're measuring voltage here. Because when you're looking at this flat part of the frequency response, you are now not only losing some power and voltage across this, you basically create a voltage divider, right? And so if RS is equal to RL, you're only seeing half of what you were seeing earlier, and 3 dB is a factor of 2. So now you're only seeing half of what you were seeing earlier. That's also come up, so that's one pretty significant problem. The second significant problem we have is the roll-off, 20 decibels per decade, or I should say negative 20 decibels per decade. 
the problem with this is it's really not that steep. Like we said we wanted negative 20 decibels. What that means is this kind of filter only really works for us if the frequencies we're filtering out are in order of magnitude off from the ones we're interested in, right? Which is not at all what we're doing. Um, and even beyond what we're doing, just generally, it's not super common that you're trying to filter frequencies that are in order of magnitude off from the space you're working in, right? So that's the second problem we have, which is this cutoff, it just really isn't that steep. and so. Um, you know, if I arbitrarily say my omega naught is say one megahertz, right? Like we can even go with the uh, sure. the three and five megahertz from a sure. mixer. So let's say this is five megahertz, or so let's say this is five megahertz. But for uh, the, the problem that doesn't work is because this isn't a band pass anyways. Right, right, right. Um, but let's say this is one megahertz, and I'm trying to filter out, uh, you know, two megahertz or whatever. 2 megahertz is basically right about here and you know we can do the simulation do the math find it out i don't want to really blindly take a guess at it but if it's negative 20 db per decade that means it would be negative 20 at 10 megahertz so at 2 megahertz it's probably closer to maybe like negative 5 negative 4 something like that below 1 megahertz really not all that much attenuation it's not really filtering it out as much as we would like so that's the second problem. So here's the thing though. We have a solution for the roll-off though, right? The solution for the roll-off is to just cascade RC filters. We know how to do that, right? I think that's something else we did in 111L, which is, all right, so sure that's a problem, but I'll just take well, another one of these here. Poles. Yeah, exactly. We add more poles. Yeah, so that's so like 40, 60, however many other poles you add. Yeah, so you keep adding them, and then this becomes negative 40, this becomes negative 60, this becomes negative 80, it becomes as steep as you want it to become. The problem is we run into that first issue we were having, right? Which is the more RC filters you keep cascading, uh, this becomes worse and worse. Because when you're then looking at it, when these capacitors are effectively open, which is when you're looking at it at the filtering frequency of it, it's basically V plus minus. There's this one resistor that's the sum of all your filter resistors. And then this is our load. And so the more poles you add, this keeps rising and rising and rising. And this voltage division keeps getting worse and worse. And so your attenuation keeps falling and falling and that's really no good because signal is really precious in RF systems and even in ours as well because amplification is pretty inefficient it's power hungry and so you know we don't want to be amplifying uh, endlessly and then there's also the fact that beyond the point there's like a noise floor that we can't control you know that comes from things like just general electromagnetic interference from just the air stuff like that um, and so if our signal becomes too small, then amplification just stops working because it kind of just gets lost into the noise. Did you have a question? No? All right. All right, so that's the problem we have. But it's not really a problem we have because this is also a problem that we saw a solution for in 111L. And that solution is on the slides over there as well. And if you're watching the recording, you can open up the sides in parallel. But the solution we saw was to add an op amp. And I'm not going to go into too much of the math here because it's all math you've seen. And, you know, you can go back and flip through it and take a look. We have some circuit diagrams on the slides as well. The point being, what the op amp does is basically um, makes the falling off of your this part this stops going lower and lower because the op amp kind of decouples let's say each rc filter from the next and gives you the necessary power you need for each cascaded filter and this works um, we saw it work in 111l uh, the problem is op amps are really really slow um, this is again something that you'll get to in 115b the reasons for that um, but suffice to say that irrespective of what circuit you're designing, 
the larger the amplitude you give it, the less the frequencies it will work at. The amplitude starts falling off pretty rapidly at higher frequencies for op amps. And so these won't work at the frequencies we want, even if you know we wanted to buy them and stuff like that. So the complication here is the frequencies we're working at. So what now? Right? Which is where we then move on to our good old friend, the inductor. And we come to LC filters. Adding an inductor has immediate benefits. Um, suddenly, this gives you a complex conjugate pair of poles. And so now, just even on that initial first diagram, this roll off is now negative 40 decibels per decade. And then there's also the fact that, and this we'll get to later, but usually when you're writing the transfer function for these out with R load and say RS, you can generally write the transfer function in a way that it accounts for R load. Um, and so when you're choosing L and C, you can kind of get in a way that this is maybe close to zero dB now. And so the part it's passing is close to zero dB, and now you start with sharper roll off. Um, also, these are reactive elements. So the, as you cascade them, you don't really get the same problems about losing power. Now, obviously, these aren't ideal, right? So you keep cascading infinitely, you will lose something from the RS of the inductor, other such things like that, non-idealities, all that stuff. But for for now, we can say that you know, doing this doesn't work now. Um, we'll get to why in just a second, but the exact theory behind a whole bunch of different topologies of LC filters isn't super necessary. Um, it's just not useful um, in that there's online tools that exist that kind of make it easier for us to work with those. And you know, there's a whole bunch of ones that you can use. So if you turn to the slides for a second, um, there is a type of filter called the Butterworth filter. Um, it's one that has benefits of being pretty flat at both the band it's passing and the band it's stopping, but the roll off is not super steep. Then you have, you know, Chebyshev filters. They're a bit sharper in terms of their drop off, but then they give you some rippling either in the pass band or the rejection band. Finally, you have something called elliptic filters. They have really sharp, you know, roll off, but they have ripples both in pass band and rejection band. Again, design trade-offs, we've been talking about them the whole quarter, everything in this project and in engineering in general is about balancing, giving up some things for others, right? You give up power to get voltage, you give up current to get voltage, things like that. So yeah, you have to give some things up to get other things and this is what we're seeing here. Um, so really quickly to come back though, um, like I was saying, you basically build ladders of LC circuits to add more and more poles. So if you have a series inductor with a capacitor and shunt, then at low free, at high free, at low frequencies, this is a short circuit, this is an open circuit, so this goes through. And at high frequencies, this is the short circuit, this is the open circuit, and so this is effectively a low pass filter. Then you have capacitor in series with inductor in parallel. And this gives you a high pass filter. Then you can start doing some pretty nifty things. You can put an inductor in parallel with a capacitor and do this. Or vice versa. You can do this. Could you check really quick which one of these was band pass and band stop? It okay. should be in the lecture notes, uh, in the comments. There we go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The first one is band pass. Pass, yeah. Um, and so this one is band pass. This one is band stop. <laughs> or something like that, um, you know. Is it not the same as stop? Like band not and band stop. Just about, yeah. Okay, that's right. Yeah. 
Um, and so basically by choosing the values for this and this carefully, you're basically putting these together in different ways. Uh, give or take is a, is a way to think about it. So then you can just keep cascading them to add more poles, make these drop-offs sharper, um, and go from there. Um, so yeah, there's that's a you know rough intuitive way to think about it. But in terms of practically designing it, we don't bother solving too much of the math ourselves because it's a pain in the ass and it's also not particularly instructive beyond the point it's transfer functions. If you wanted to, you could write it out. You could look up a topology, write out the transfer function and solve for the values yourself. It's just not particularly helpful. So we use online tools. Um, really recommend this one. It's pretty nifty. Um, RF tools. RF tools. Um, they have a whole bunch of different calculators. For our purposes, we're gonna be using the filter calculator. Um, Try to keep the order to about an order three filter, um, just because, like we were talking about in terms of the how much uh, power you lose at the fast frequencies, that increases as you increase them. Also in terms of cost of the board and how big the design is and how much layout you have to do later, it's going to be a lot more manageable if you keep it at three. Um, after that, I would say for types of filter, maybe choose between the Butterworth and the Chebyshev filter. I think there's like a whole list of options this gives you. Yes. Um, honestly, I don't right. even know what some of those mean, but I would say just you know use the butter word and check the shelf. They're easy to design around. Um, so so what, no, I remember these names from physics honors. <laughs> okay. This was bad then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So actually, a lot of these do come from math. So like the Chebyshev the name it comes from Chebyshev polynomials uh, Chebyshev polynomials are a series of functions in math um, I, I could sketch them out again they're, they're not particularly instructive I, I'm also not fully sure what they mean um, all I do know is that you can basically plug the Chebyshev polynomial into the function for poles of a filter and then that gives you some neat properties um, so yeah, you can set the lower and upper cutoff frequencies based on what you want to pass. So let's say you want to pass 27. Oh, yeah, say 27 was in and you gave it one megahertz on each side, that might be generous. So, uh, and then uh, you can set the top. And then, okay. then I'll click. And then here are some values you can set it to probably when you're actually going through and designing your uh, system you want to set it to use standard values so that it's actually components you can buy with a given, given tolerance um, and then uh, over here it'll show you the uh, magnitude and phase response so here you can see like yep 27 between uh, 26 and 28 um, the anyway this zero dB attenuation. And then, uh, yeah, so basically you'll kind of tweak it, tweak how much ripple you'll allow, etc. Uh, get some of the trade offs, and then um, basically make it so, um, like, uh, the frequencies you're trying to reject, you can, you know, put the cursor there and see what frequency you want. But the frequency you're trying to reject, you want it to be about 20 decibels lower than the one you're trying to pass there. Yeah. So, so you can use that about by 29.5 megahertz the attenuation is going to about minus 20. Sure. Right. So. so yeah um, and you can you know basically play around with this then you'll add filters at different stages to see what happens. Um, so you want to try and keep the so the two things you want to be concerned about you want this to be as flat and as close to zero as possible and then whatever frequency you're interested in you want that to be 20 decibels lower. Um, one last note is, personally I would recommend for topology sticking with direct coupled shunt capacitor. Um, the reason for this is if Tyler you want to flip the direct coupled series capacitor, and okay. I'm confused, you'll notice that if you scroll down a bit, this basically got flipped. Earlier this sharper roll off was on that side of it, and this kind of gentler thing was on this side. Not, not gentler, but it kind of reaches this flat point a bit sooner than this one starts flattening out. Uh, the reason we would want 
it to keep dropping for farther along is because if you think back to the frequency diagrams we uh, drew up in lecture three, um, the harmonics from the pseudo square wave behavior of the LO are all at higher frequencies. And so to make sure that we're rejecting those well, um, we want this to be on that side of the filter. So as you mess around with the different topologies, you'll see that that's what it comes to. Um, and yeah, that's really it. Um, after this, like, like, like I said, that, that, that's it for the filter part of it. Um, like we've been saying throughout this, we're not going to get too deep into the math behind all of these. They, they come from different smart people who did different smart things in math equations and applied them to filters. I'm pretty sure Chebyshev polynomials are used, in all over the, used all over the place. This is just one application we find for them. Um, and you know, it gives you some nifty properties and you can play around with it. Um, I would say primarily it's probably a bit easier to kind of just fix these as soon as you can. So, you know, choose Chebyshev or Butterworth, set this to say direct couple shunt capacitors that be ordered to three. Um, so order is how many are cascaded? Right? Yes. Yeah. Um, order three, so try and choose all orders because that gives you some symmetry in the circuit's layout and the circuit values. Um, with the uh, even order, some of those values then look a bit uglier. <coughs> um, <It's laughs> why? Why? What are you doing? Sure, why not? Let's take it off. So you see, like there's no longer, like there's no longer, there's no longer like any real repeating pattern. Like some of these values seem similar, but there's there's no like consistent pattern. Where wow. whereas if you select an odd or look at this roll off, dude. <laughs> <laughs> dude, 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 can you change it to Legendre or Bessel? Nah, I'll pass. I mean, you may as well see, I mean, it should sure work. Let's take a look. It's hard to roll watch it recording. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no, yeah, you can, you can uh, mess around with this stuff. Um, honestly, once you have something <laughs> like this, if, if, you're, if you're playing around with it, it might be fun to like create these circuits in LD Spice, right? And in LD Spice, you can even go with exact, define a Pico Ferro, like 19, 19, I have one, one nine bits and like see how it behaves. Uh, try different load resistors, try different source resistors, try different amplitudes, signals, all that, all that cool stuff. Might be fun to play around with. So yeah, have, have some fun with this. But what I was saying earlier is basically try and fix these four. And then for the rest of it, when you're trying to modify this, primarily work around with these two um, fields, right? So the way you might do that is if you're seeing that this you know, roll off is steeper in one direction versus the other, Maybe you shift your frequency, center frequency just a bit. So you maybe move this to 26.5 to 27.5, right? Maybe you move it to 26.7 to 27.7, uh, depending on what range exactly gives you the sharp enough drop by the frequency you're trying to reject. Yes. You want to talk about fractional bandwidth here? Yes. So this is not directly related to this, but I promised, or we promised you guys, a brief discussion on why we're doing the up conversion in two steps. And at the time, in the assignment, we kind of waved our hands, said fractional bandwidth, and moved swiftly on, and said that we would talk about it in lecture four. And here we are in lecture four. So first, what is fractional bandwidth? Fractional bandwidth is basically, um, if you think of the filter like this, uh, and this is what it rejects, then it's this frequency, This it's the difference between these two frequencies divided by the center frequency. So it's uh, F1, So this is the fractional bandwidth. Um, pretty intuitive definition. Anyone think this looks similar to something in the way it's defined? Uh, is it? Well, I see why it's definitely is bandwidth. Sure. But if you think back to when you were looking at, say, an LC resonant tank with some resistor, and you were defining the Q factor for that, I think the plot looked somewhat similar to this. And then you chose the two points here where the amplitude or where the power was one half or the amplitude was one over root two to the max. And then you 
chose the center and then I think Q was the inverse of this where I think Q is actually the voltage at the center over the difference between these two or basically the frequencies at which these two happen. My, my point being that this is kind of like a systems or frequency analog for quality factor, right? And so the reason we did this in the two steps, the reason we split our up conversion into two steps is because a higher fractional bandwidth or smaller fractional bandwidth requires components that are of higher quality factor. And that becomes harder and harder to find in real life. And it requires to be to build circuits that as a whole have higher quality factors. So it's slightly disingenuous to say components of better quality factors, although it kind of works out like that. But if you take a bunch of inductors and capacitors, write out their nonlinearities, find the effective loading R, find their behavior, then you can get like a net Q factor. It's not exactly like you add up the Q factors or anything. It's a bit more complicated than that. But better components will obviously lead to a better Q factor for the overall thing as well. Um, and so the reason we did this rigmarole of, you know, hey, we're going to filter out the this difference. We don't want this difference to be 1 when this is 27. We want this difference to be larger when this is 27. And if this is 1, then we're going to make the denominator 5. And then by the time this has to go there, then we make this 10. I think, right? Because it's 17, 27, yeah, 10. Um, or technically 5, because you can really get sure. 5 by 27, right? So we want our filters to have fractional bandwidths of 1 by 5 and 1, 5 by 27, rather than of 1 by 27, because it makes implementation of these filters easier in terms of finding components of sufficient Q factors. Yeah, so kind of just another way to phrase it is um, so like a high Q filter will be very sharp like uh, it'll be very selective but um, that is harder to achieve with real parts right so uh, the Q factor of the filter is uh, like you said an analog of that would be the fractional bandwidth so uh, that's kind of how a measure of how relatively narrow it is, or how wide the fast band is relative to the frequency it's at. Um, so the less sharp it needs to be, the easier it is to actually physically realize with a reason low enough order system. You could have like a 15 order filter and maybe it'll be really sharp, but that's hard to accomplish. Yeah. Okay. So that's fractional bandwidths. Um, so that's really, I think, all we have for the discussion on filters. Um, are there any other questions about that? Yeah, um, we, uh, we'll give out some, I think we'll send out some guidelines for kind of summarizing this, how to go about selecting your filters and just some rules of thumbs to go with. Um, because we're not going into the theory of them too much, we'll just be like, use this tool, do order three, here's a brief blurb why, uh, do this because this, and that's just kind of the working knowledge of how to do with these. Okay, I think we're, uh, I think we're ready. Yeah, um, we're going to move to overall design then because once you have the filters you're kind of good to go so let's start with the transmitter yeah sure so spinning again Are you drawing the transmitter right now? Yes. Okay. By modulator, are you talking about the microcontroller? Yes. Okay.
basically missed an amplifier going into the from mo between modulator and hello or a buffer rather. Uh, we don't have like feed all that motivation at the end, although you can do it. Right here? Yeah. Like, after like coming from the microcontroller, there's just some we have a buffer before it oh, gets mixed. Sure. I was gonna Yeah. Okay. That's what I'm uh, when you're saying the design when you intercode it, do you mean schematics and ego or uh, no, we mean we mean like in LP spikes. Oh okay. Yeah. Because uh, one uh, thing that we yeah. have one lecture about early in winter is um some things about trace length and trace thickness that you need to keep in mind when designing circuits for these frequencies. Oh. So then the schematics would be after that, maybe closer to halfway through winter. What this symbol for an antenna is, so it's no longer a box. <laughs> um, so, really high level, this is what our system looks like. Modulator, which is our microcontroller, we'll be talking about this in winter when we start talking about the digital signal processing. All this is doing is taking ones and zeros and encoding them, basically. So, actually, maybe modulator isn't the best word, but let's run with it for now. Um, encoding them or modulating nah. encoding them onto our sine wave of one megahertz. That comes out of here, gets mixed, filtered, mixed again, filtered, amplified, transmitted through the antenna. And that's what our system looks like. Um, yeah. There's a few MIDI like, connecting blocks that need to go in these arrows though, and we'll be talking about some of those. and talking about why you need them here. So, Tyler, you want to take us off with that? Um, sure. Let's see. Um, so, I guess real quick. So, modulator going into a... Uh, so, when you say modulator, that's going to be our microcontroller. And then, uh, so we'll talk about BPSK. Like, uh, it's our digital encoding scheme. Uh, so that'll come out at a frequency of uh, 1 megahertz. And Here's the thing with our microcontroller. Uh, the voltage output from the uh, digital to analog converter is uh, from 0 to 3.3 volts. Um, we want to remove that DC offset. So when we, so in, in our actual physical system, like a, we'll have some wires connect to a, a header, and then we'll have traces. Um, so, um, you can just use a decoupling capacitor and go into like a, a buffer. So uh, I'll just draw this for now, but that's that can be like a common collector buffer kind of thing uh, before we go into the uh, mixer with the, uh, the transformers and all that. Um, so basically, um, so going from the microcontroller's output from 0 to 3.3, we want to subtract that DC offset before we shove it into all this. So um, we'll just, so you'll, you would use a decoupling capacitor um, to accomplish that. Um, also, every component here, like uh, the LOs, um, the, the oscillators, the amplifiers, etc., cetera, uh, they need power. So uh, another thing that we'll uh, have you guys do is uh, just uh, a really common voltage regulator module is the L um, eight seven zero five L seven eight zero five. I don't know, whatever. Um, there's a we have a bunch of them in the lab already ordered, so you can just stick them on your board. Look at the data sheet for how to hook it up. Um, I think uh, I think the discussion of how those works is left to the kind of earlier projects prior experience. Sure. It's a voltage regulator. Um, it's an IC, you add it to your schematic and connect 5 volts where you need it. But, um, um, for the purpose of LED spy simulations, you can just keep using a fixed 5 volt DC source, um, but we need to actually create that um, in the circuit. So we'll be hooking batteries to it, but we need some voltage regulators to handle it. So yeah, it's a standard IC. It's a easy to read data sheet. I'm pretty sure they have standard use cases on there. Just copy paste it and you're good to go. Um, so yeah, you have this. Um, common collector buffer, why do we need this? 
Um, if you read the data sheet for the microcontrollers that we are using, which I realize now you guys haven't had the opportunity to do, and that's something that we will share through the bomb. Uh, I'll get to that in a second, actually. But if you read the data sheet for <coughs> if you read the data sheet for the microcontrollers you are using, you realize that along with being centered at around 1.8 volts with the swing going from 3.3 to zero, uh, these also have an output impedance of 15 kilo ohms. So you will ideally want to design the common collector plus capacitor thing here such that it has an input impedance of 15 kilo ohms so that you're getting maximal power maximum power into your circuit. Mm -hmm. So that's basically this arrow here, which will be some kind of decoupling capacitor followed by a pretty straightforward common collector um, uh, amplifier or buffer. Yeah. Um, after that, you kind of go into mixer, into filter, into mixer, into filter, amplifier, so on. But a few things here. Um, one, if you go, if you recall when we were discussing the filters, we said that when we write the transfer function for an LC filter, we write it so that it accounts for the input and output impedance of 50 ohms, the input and output load. You'll see that on the RF tools website that we give you as well, where it has these two options for input and output loads. Um, the defaults that it comes with are 50 ohms, and generally speaking, 50 ohms seems to be some kind of standard that's used um, for like different PNC cables that you can use with signal generators or oscilloscopes. Um, they also have like these 50 ohm terminator modules. The antenna we're using has an impedance of 50, it has a resistance of 50 ohms that it portrays. So it seems to be like a pretty common value that you see across RF. I'm not sure why. It could just be historical reasons, or there could be some significance there. Um, the point being, these work best, and their filter characteristics really work if they're being terminated in 50 ohm resistors. Now, mixers aren't that, right? Mixers. I mean, that's why we added the buffers for the yellow. Like mixers are pain in the ass. They can be anything and everything and we didn't bother working them out because it would be a pain. So this is where something that's called a T attenuator comes in, which is basically just this. Um, and usually it will be R1, R1, and R2. Um, again, this the Calculations behind this are pretty straightforward to go through if you're interested. Um, for our purposes, you go on Google, type in T attenuator calculator, and it gives you a whole bunch of calculators, and they usually have two fields. It'll ask you for how much attenuation you want and how much impedance you want. So your impedance is 50 ohms because you want it to appear as a 50 ohm resistor or 50 ohm load to the filter. And this is um, let's see. Uh, and this you want to try and keep it basically as small as possible. Um, what you'll see basically really quickly is if you put this to be zero, what it'll tell you is these two need to be zero and this needs to be infinity because that's literally the only way to get zero loss across a resistor network. So obviously that doesn't work. So then maybe you try 0 0.5. Then you have R1 of like 3 milli ohms and you're like, well, I can't really buy a 3 milli ohm resistor, so let me increase it some more. And so typically around, say, 2 to 3 dB, maybe 4, so 2 to 4 dB, these values will come close to maybe 10-ish, 10 ohms, whatever, and at that point, it's maybe a bit more reasonable. So you want to keep this as small as possible, play around with it again, it's an online calculator you can use. You want to basically try to keep the loss as small as possible. Um, and so this thing would go here, and well, this this is a common emitter, so you can set the input impedance however you'd like. Um, I suppose technically, if you really wanted, you could use a common collector for to do something like this as well. It's just this is three resistors. That's at a minimum usually like three resistors, a transistor, 
probably two decoupling capacitors go for it if you want to it'll increase your bomb by a bit not significantly much so if you really want to i say go for it it'll just make your design and layout a bit more painful but it's not the end of the world if you don't want to get into these that's fine um and finally then you have amplification into your antenna so um when you're modeling the antenna in lt spice your antenna is just going to be a 50 ohm resistor um similarly when you're modeling your input in lt spice the way you want to do it is create a voltage source um set it to be a sine wave with a dc offset of say 1.8 volts and then an amplitude of 3.3 volts 1.8 seems high uh, three, uh, or 1.65, there we go. So, yeah, 1.7 or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, peak to peak, 3.3, yeah. um, amplitude 1.7. So, yeah, this is V peak to peak, um, and V peak is 1.7 volt. So, you can model the thing as this and then set the internal resistance to be 15k. Our source. And that's how you can model the microcontroller in LD spice with that voltage source and obviously frequency of one megahertz. All right, so that's I think just about. Oh yeah, last thing, amplifier, which is the question to be answered by this amplifier is how much gain do we want? this output to be at, that is what amplitude do we want this output to be at. Um, so there is uh, there is math you can do about the attenuation of an RF signal in the air um, as it goes, as it transmits through the air. Um, if you recall, um, I think this was in physics classes, it usually varies by distance with a power of 4. Um, how, amplitude, uh, how power decays with distance uh, when you're transmitting a wave through the air. Um, I think it was a factor of power of four, um, but maybe don't hold me to that. Anyways, the point being, for our purposes, we want the amplitude for this, going into this, to be roughly about centered around zero, about 500 to 600 millivolts negative 500 to 600 millivolts so v peak to peak of about 1 to 1.2 volts um since when you're doing these simulations you'll be doing a lot of it in the ffd domain i think this roughly translates to about negative 10 db um and like ideally you want this to be as close to zero as possible So that is your goal for the design, which is to have a 27 megahertz signal at the output here that is being modulated by a 1 megahertz wave that has an amplitude of this, and that's filtered so that any harmonics are at least negative 20 decibels lower than it. And it's Sounds like a lot, but I assure you, as you start going through it, it's actually pretty straightforward. I would definitely recommend breaking it off into chunks and making sure at each step you're seeing what you expect. Um, for the buffer here, um, for the amplifier here, depending on what exactly your output here is, you might need multiple stages of amplification. Um, so when you're doing that, you know, try and split it evenly. Um, if you try and do too much amplification in one, you start pushing the uh, transistor into saturation or out of forward active because you start eating into the headroom at the output. Split it about evenly. It'll let you recenter your bias point for the next stage and then go from there. Um, so you might need two, maybe three stages of amplification, probably only two. Um, it might be use helpful to add an impedance transformer here if you need it, if 50 ohms isn't enough. Um, output resistance because the gain of a common emitter does depend on the resistance you're seeing at the output. So if you need to add an impedance transformer there, you can. We talked about that. 
way back in assignment one, I think, um, and we talked about how that helps you maintain a certain gain value, even if your resistance is smaller at the output, your load resistance, that is. Um, so yeah, that's your transmitter overall design, and that's kind of what we'll be you know, look, hoping that you guys can put together by early in winter quarter and what we'll be discussing with you guys once you're back. Um, Speed run receiver. Oh, uh, wait, wait, before we do that, any questions oh. about this chain? No? Sweet. Um, if, there's any, <laughs> if there's any questions, feel free to reach out to us on Discord or whatever. We're happy to discuss this as many times as you'd like. All right, uh, take this off. Oh, I was just gonna draw it to emphasize how similar it was, so it won't be as pretty as my mobs, but um, your antenna. So this is the receiver. Um, I'm gonna filter it first, then uh, we're gonna amplify. Uh, then, same as before. Um, Okay, so it's almost the same thing, just in reverse. Um, see your antenna, filter out any unwanted, pre basically filter out the what we're looking for. Amplify it up because it's been attenuated over the air. The reason we amplify after we filter is so we don't amplify noise because signal like, oh, noise ratio. Um, send that. Then this is. These mixes are for performing our down conversion. Um, filter in between, as before. Um, when we're going into the microcontroller, small note there, um, the analog to digital converter, much like the digital to analog converter, um, it wants to see something between 0 and 3.3. Everything here so far has not had a DC offset. Also, it's being powered at 5 volts. so. Um, we need to make sure it's in the range and fitted. We, we need our signal to be fit between 0 and 3.3. So uh, I don't know what the best official way to do it is, but uh, some, something I threw together uh, over the summer was, um, you know how going into our, uh, like uh, going into our uh, amplifiers, we had these two uh, bias resistors to get it up to a certain point. So uh, one thing you can do is send the signal in and then uh, choose R1, R2 so that it uh, is shifted up to your bias voltage, which yeah. in our case is just going to be 1.65, right between uh, right in the middle of 3.3 volts. Yeah. And uh, if you need to amplify it at all to get it to the to take advantage of as much of that range as possible and do so. Yeah, you, you want to fill that up as much as possible because that basically gives the um, microcontroller more resolution to actually sample the data points it's collecting for the reading. Um, yeah, most of this is pretty straightforward. You need some kind of 50 ohm fixing impedance here, here. Um, actually, real quick, a really quick and dirty way to get the filters sort of terminated in 50 ohms if you really can't get any of the other ways to work if it's giving you too much trouble. Just stick a 50 ohm resistor here to ground. 
Um, it obviously it's not really what we want to do, but it works well enough to help the filter retain some of its properties. So that is a trick you can do. Um, I would much prefer if you guys you know made an attempt at some of the other things we've discussed and then if you can't get those to work then in winter we can default to these if it's becoming a bit of an issue with regards to time in the process yeah. yeah right now we're just kind of throwing in a bunch of tricks that we figured out along the way when we were designing the system ourselves at you um, um, i think so uh, real quick yeah. finally um you when you're like just registering your final design or no Say again? Did you guys do just to register the ground in your final design? Or? Um, in one spot we did, but in other places we tried to use key attenuators and so just I'm not sure if I want. Um, so basically, as you make your attenuator simpler, um, it kind of starts feeding into whether it only attenuates one way or protects both ways, right? Which is, does it only protect the filter from this stuff in the mixer, or does it go both ways in the sense that does it also protect um, how does it do this actually? What's the yeah, they basically like do you, do you see the interference um, kind of disappearing only on one side of it or on both sides of it? Mm -hmm. um, so, especially with attenuators, the cool way to think about it like, has everyone here taken 101A or at least is in 101A? Mm -hmm. So, you guys remember like reflection coefficients? Mm -hmm. Um, basically, what we're doing is increasing the line impedance so that the reflection coefficient is a bit worse, give or take. So what we're basically doing is for the signal that's being reflected back, we're adding, if you add, say, a 50 ohms there, that's, um, and so you add a 50 ohms along the way, and let's say your source resistance was also 50 ohms. What you're basically doing is, let's say this is being transmitted at some x dB, you're subtracting three on the way there, and then on the way back, you're subtracting another three, right? And so what you're basically doing is you're subtracting six decibels from X in terms of how much this is interfering with the original signal you sent. Um, the problem with a 50 ohm straight to ground is you don't really get this part of that. And so some of the protection is worse then, if that kind of helps clarify things. Um, sorry, but uh, the last thing I wanted to say is uh, when we were talking about the uh, transmitter in terms of how you simulate it in anti spice, I talked about what the voltage source you use to model the microcontroller and similarly for the antenna, what resistor you use. Here, you use a 15 kilo ohm resistor to model the pin of the microcontroller because that's its uh, internal impedance. And the model the antenna, you would use a voltage source. So in this case, you would have a sine wave centered at zero. Um, and I'll get back to that in a second. The source resistance is 50 ohms. And the frequency is 27 megahertz. Um, here again, we start coming back to basically what do we want to design our system for, right? Because whatever amplitude we set here affects how much uh, amplification we need to do later down the chain and that kind of starts coming back to well how far a distance are we designing our system for do we want to our system to be able to capture signals that are one millivolts 0.1 millivolts one microvolts one nanovolt like how small a signal do we want to be able to capture with this system right and that will affect how big this amplitude is um i believe We've basically just gone with one millivolt, and that's negative 60 dB. Actually, I think it might have been 10 millivolts, and so negative 40 dB. Um, I'll, we'll, we'll clarify this exactly. Um, I don't recall off the top of my head, but basically this number we've chosen is roughly to allow for about 100 meters. Um, in air um, from assuming an output of 0 dB to this would receive then from your uh, disturbance in air a signal negative 40 dB. Obviously we're not outputting exactly 0 dB and so you know designed with some headroom in mind but I'll send a clarification as to exactly what voltage this needs to be. 
Um, but again, a good way to check is to always just read the FFT wherever you're looking, see what power you're getting, see if it lines up with what you would expect and go from there. So that's how you would model the input antenna and how you would model in this case the output microcontroller. And this stuff would largely be exactly, honestly, this part of it, you can just copy and paste it from the transmitter and then rehook where you measure input and output for IF and RF of the mixers. Because the filters will, you might need to change the filters because now you would be filtering for slightly different frequencies. On the way up, you're filtering for five and then 27. On the way down, you would filter for 22 and then one. So the filters would need some modification. But by and large, like the, the bulk of this circuit would stay the same in terms of connection pattern and stuff like that. So yeah, and once you have that, then you have to design, you have designed the communication modules transmitter and receiver. So honestly, by assignment three, you've already done most of the heavy lifting. You've done amplification, you've done filter, uh, you've done mixers. Filters were just you know using simple calculators because they're not super instructive to do. So in terms of the intuition for how most of this works, you've already done that work. Um, any questions about this part of it? Uh, I'll send more. We don't really have a date in mind. We were thinking it would probably be design reviews in like the end of week one okay. of winter because like not the next ten days, right? No, okay. no, no, no. There's there's nothing due before or after finals, okay. right? Um, <coughs> so here's the thing. Um, ideally, we'd love to just let you have winter break be winter break. Unfortunately, it's a longer winter break this year. It's like two and a half weeks instead of the usual two or one and a half weeks. Um, so we'll probably have the review towards the end of winter quarter. We'll be available through Discord if you have any questions throughout winter break. Um, response times might be a bit lower. Um, I might be in India, stuff like that. So it might be a bit slower, but we will get back to you. Um, but yeah, we're happy to work with you throughout the break as well. Give this some time, some minimal fraction of your time. Have fun, obviously. And then the reason we want this to be at the end of week one is so that you have some time to also, you know, get back together, sit in a room together, and work on this together. You know, maybe you've done most of it or some of it throughout winter break, and then you can kind of buckle down and push it while classes are doing introductions and other random bullshit. So, yeah, that's. That's everything for the hardware, guys. Or at least everything for fall. That's a wrap indeed. That's a wrap for fall. You wanna kill the recording?